hey, 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 good people. Grits or cream of wheat? Who the hell is racist? Does anyone ever ask could they touch your hair? <laughs> Woo. Black Like Me. You're listening to Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G., a podcast that invites you to experience the world through the perspective of one black man, one conversation, one story, or even one rant at a time. Here's Dr. G. Hey, good folks. In the past few weeks, we have surpassed our, our, our daily download record about six times. It's been incredible. This is a great time to be the podcast host of Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G. I'm just loving it. But because we're having so many new people, we're wanting to drop old um, um, episodes. And you know this. I've said it before because it helps people to go back. Because once you're new to something, not everyone has the discipline or the time to go back to the beginning. So we're trying to tease people with a few episodes to make them say, you know what? I'm going to go back to season two or season three. So this episode that's coming up next is with the Honorable Reverend Everett, Everett Mitchell. He's a colleague. He's a good brother. Um, he is a, he's a, a, a judge here in Dane County. He's a fellow pastor, um, brilliant thinker. And he appeared on Black Like Me. And he said, you know, the pipeline of prison isn't just school. It really is social services. And um, he just brought it. So he tells a little bit about his own story, too. It's really, really powerful. Listen to this. This is a judge talking about our social service systems. I know that people are looking with new eyes because of what's happening in the world today. Listen with new ears. This is a resource that will help you to see things um, from a different perspective because it's how we often talk. We African-Americans when it's just us in the room. So please share this episode with folks who are attorneys, judges in law enforcement um, in education. Share this because I think that this insight is invaluable. All right. Enjoy. I'm really excited about today's episode. And, um, you know, I just think, you know, we just need to all rise because the Honorable Judge Everett Mitchell is in the studio today. So we have a great, great show. This is a this is a Dane County Circuit Court judge. And I'm just going to be talking to him about his life and um, growing up and his work here. But this this young this young man is uh, so impressive and so encouraging. And we've known each other for years. And so I'm really glad that he's here. So, Judge Mitchell, welcome to Black Like Me. I'm really glad that you're here today. Alex, I'm glad to be here with you, man. So thank you for the invitation. Sure, man, sure, sure. Hey, listen, I don't know if you've been able to catch um, any of the episodes, but I always open up with something that I call Black Ice Breaker. All right. And so it's just a way just to check in, check in with people and just loosen them up. And, you know, I, so it's just it's just interesting to find out a little bit a little bit more about, about folks. And so let me just run down my list. Is that okay with you? Sounds good. All right. Uh, sweet potato pie or pumpkin pie? Sweet potato pie. <laughs> Mayonnaise or Miracle Whip? Mayonnaise. Okay. Tabasco or Frank's? Tabasco. All right, all right. Uh, have you ever cross country skied, downhill skied, or water skied? I've never even touched a ski. <laughs> <laughs> so, no. That kind of makes up for the mayonnaise yeah. answer. Okay, all right, that's good. Let me see. Are you old enough to uh, remember a TV show's Good Times or the Jeffersons? Of course. Can you see? Good times, anytime you need a baby. Good times. Oh, we moving on now? <laughs> you know, oh, nobody you, knows. You, you, nobody you, knows that second part of that good times. I know. No, 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 no. You know what? I googled it because I wanted to know. Um, standing in a child yeah. line. Yeah, I thought I it was know. a child line. I don't know what it was. You know, yeah. You kind of do, I know. Right? I think Dave Chappelle was the one who. Oh uh, yeah, he did. So I found he it. Did, he did something about that too. Oh, on Jeopardy or something like that. Yeah. Um, easy credit ripoff. All right, all right. Hey, when you're growing up, did you have a crush on Rudy or Vanessa Huxtable? Both. Did you? Oh, okay. Both. I was young enough to still be in the same. I actually went to uh, school down when she was at Spelman. I was at Morehouse with Rudy Huxley. Really? Yeah. Was she as cute in person as she was on TV? She's beautiful and impressive. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's real sharp. Um, <laughs> when you were a kid, did you break dance on cardboard or knew people who did? Of course. And we had. I had the pants. We had the... 
the outfits and we did the break dance. I wasn't good at it. But, you weren't good at it, but y'all had to. Everybody had to break dance. You just couldn't. Oh man, you couldn't survive the hood. If and you people would throw like dance. cash at your money. I, this wasn't New York. No, this you was didn't Texas. Get no money? <laughs> <laughs> this is <laughs> this Texas. Texas. So, like, no, you just doing it to survive to fit <laughs> in. Like get up off that sidewalk, boy. Exactly. Did you ever skip gym class because your knees were ashy? No, everybody's knees were ashy. <laughs> I went to all black schools. So everybody's knees, everybody's were ashy. knees was ashy. That puts even more pressure on. Oh man, do you have a favorite your mama joke? I'm not gonna give that one away. Okay, not gonna... <laughs> but yes, I got a whole bunch of you your got, mama you jokes. Got a whole, you got a whole bunch of them. <laughs> now, um, now this is. So man, I, okay, that's good. That's good. I always like to. I try to ask everyone different questions. I don't have set ones, so these are these are my Everett Mitchell, uh, uh, black ice uh, breakers. But I've got some other ice breakers I want to ask you about that are not necessarily about being black. But one, who is your favorite TV judge? Are you allowed to say that? I don't have a favorite TV judge. Okay, do you, they are entertainers? They are, okay. I was gonna okay. I was gonna ask you that. All right. So if you were a TV judge, what would you do that's different than what they're doing? If I were a TV judge, one is about entertainment, but I, you know, I do have this idea where you could do like a, I could be a judge and pastor. That'd be a new niche where oh. you could you could do have your own little TV show to kind of combine both words at the same time. Right, so, right. So you really just want to give a sense that the law really is about selling disagreements that people can't sell on their own. So can you do that within the little time frame that they give you on TV when really more? Most court cases are way more complex than just a little snippet that right. you'll see produced on right. TV. So you'd have like your collar on over your robe, or I'd have, or I have, or some kind of stole on top of the robe. Really, the black robe. Yeah, ha, I didn't come here to judge today. <laughs> <laughs> Give me fifteen more minutes. Yeah, something like that. Baylor, <laughs> put me in A flat. Yeah, no. no, no. Do you, now? Do you know of any judges who have worn only the underclothes underneath their robes, or are you not allowed to say? Only the underclothes? Yeah, I was here like no. <laughs> that's just a judge system you just hear on TV. I do, I do know that there are there are oh. judges who you know will wear like top clothes and then maybe shorts and flip flops or oh really? Or not, you know, up under because you can't see. Yeah, that's okay. Well, I so, wondered about that. That's you know, I try to ask questions that I think people have been wondering about. I hope people are not really wondering about that. Oh my well, goodness! Whether not that judge you know, has I was, no clothes. Yo man, um, hey Tyler, you ever, have you ever sat before a black judge? Really? Why don't you come over and sit down for a minute? Because I got to sit in front of white judges all the time. I want. All right. All right. Um, put your hand on my iPhone. <laughs> Are you about to tell the truth? Yes. Okay. You got a parking ticket recently because you tried to use your mobile app and it didn't work. I did. All right. You got a judge that's here. Go ahead. Plead your, plead your case. Why do you think you shouldn't have to pay that? I already paid it, unfortunately. <laughs> Wait a minute! Yeah, you didn't even go to court. You didn't even go to court. That's the best kind. Oh, that's a, okay. So that's the best kind. He admit, wow. he, he admit guilt and oh pay it. Oh my keep goodness! So there's no way. He can, so judge, there's no way he can talk his talk his way out of that one. Doesn't need to. He already paid the fine. <laughs> wow, Tyler. We appreciate that. Okay, we and appreciate they, that. I right, don't want the headache, you know. All right, Tyler. Oh, I in the can't interest hold of justice. In the interest of justice. <laughs> you know, take care of. All right, Tyler. That was a pretty easy. Okay. All right. That's a pretty I'm easy sorry, case. All right. I was gonna hold you in contempt of court. <laughs> all right. All right, man. We don't want to lock him up. We, <laughs> we don't want to lock, lock him up. I just want. I just want him just to experience a little bit. Of, a little bit of life. So, so you're serving in your community in so many capacities, and so you're you're a pastor of a of a church. It's a multicultural, multi class, multi age church, and you're balancing that with being a circuit court. Judge, because in our community, because you and I are both pastors, it's not unusual to run nonprofits or to do other kinds of work. But I haven't met that many judges who are also pastors. It, you, have you met many others who are who are both judges and pastors? No, I don't at think the same I've, time? I don't think I've met anybody <laughs> who will fits that combination uh, in my experience. I do know that there was a very active uh, pastor down south uh, who's also a judge, but I'm not sure if he. Uh, if he was both passing and being a judge at the same time. I do don't know that other people, other pastors who have been certain kind of judges where you don't necessarily right. need law degrees, but to meet one that is at the level where you have a constitutional power to restrict people's freedom and be in this role, I just haven't met anyone who, who has done that yet. Well, well, congratulations on trailblazing in that area because I know some of us in the community were wondering um, just with the time constraints of being a judge, and we know what it what it requires to be a pastor, um, if you'd be able to to 
to hold on and to do both of them. But to me, that's just really impressive and important to be able to hold both of those mm. together. So, man, I appreciate that. Yeah, I think emotionally it's, it's intriguing to look at the fact that, you know, kind of Tyler was like, I've never seen, you know, been in front of a judge. There are a lot of young African-American children and families that they don't even know an African-American judge. Right. And so being in my congregation, that's one thing that I can check off the list. All of those children right. who have grown up under my right. pastoral lineage, one of the things they will always say is, it was normal for them to see a black judge wow. because their pastor was a judge. That's and, that's and so, very important. So we need to expose other churches to that too, man. Yeah, we really do. That's normal. important. Um, you know, there there's some interesting quotes um, on your on your email signature, and one in particular, the one by Maya Angelou, stands out to me. It just says, "History, despite it despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, um, need not be lived again." That's a that's a powerful quote. What about that quote made you want to? Put that up. So when I so when I took the bench, one of the things that you know we talk about all the time is the uh, racial disparities. We talk about right. the inequalities in this justice system. We we talk about the imbalances that we see as it relates to African American men who are going into the systems. So when I decided to become a judge, ultimately, you know, I'm making the decision to go back into a system uh, okay. that okay. we that we push against, we criticize, and so I'm going to become a part of that system. So the question I had to ask myself is that do do I have to go into this system and then repeat what I've already seen or can I go back in it to make sure that you know the people who come before me or the cases that I have or just the influence that I have do I have to relive that and and I think the the choices I'm choosing to make as it relates to the balance between my role when I'm on the bench and then my right. role off the bench uh, I don't think we have to relive those. I think we can learn from it right. and chart a new path for how we how we engage these systems sure sure you know, I um I remember being at at the celebration um, after you're swearing in at the Madison Club, and um you know you were standing there and taking pictures and 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 giving a giving a speech, but I don't know if you were um, in touch enough because you were just caught up in the day in the celebration. That room was just swelling, was brimming with pride. You know, as the community leaders were st- black community leaders were standing there thinking. You know, sometimes folks are elected to the bench and they try to reach out to our community or some crisis will happen and they'll say, you know, we need to try to understand the black community. But knowing um, your background as, a, as an assistant DA, the pro bono work that you've done working at, um, at Madison Urban Ministry, um, understanding issues of reentry and mass incarceration, also understanding the, the, um, one of the major f- um, fibers of the black community, the black church. And knowing that you embodied all of that and you're taking that into the courtroom with you, man, that was that was overwhelming. That that day was really, really emotional. As I stood there and I thought about um, the potential of what this could mean for our community. I'm sure that comes, you know, with with pressure. But were you aware that people were actually standing there thinking, man, this gives us hope. This gives us hope for this community, not just because he's black and he's on the bench, because that's not new. We have black lawyers who are mm-hmm. on the benches across the country. Not enough. But the fact that you know the community and its pains and its secrets and its um, its hopes, and for you to bring all that information to the bench, man, that's that's a coup. Do you, I mean, do you, do, you, do you think about it that way when you're, when mm-hmm. you're sitting there? I think that, you know, I bring a unique set of skills and experiences and the That's for sure. And because of that I I, I sense that hope, I sense that requirement, uh, that I always focus on, you know, making sure that our community stays at the front. But what I also sensed in that room was a sense that the community had made a choice to protect me so that mm-hmm. I could continue to do the work that I'm doing. So wow. you know, one side of it it is the pride in it. But then the second part is their sense that, all right, we want you to do the work, so we will be there to protect you to ensure That's that important. you continue to do your work. And that that part of it was a little bit um, – that, that's what made me really step back and say, all right, this is this is a unique role, you know, and, um, and they see it as important. And so we need to ensure that not only am I going to stay focused on the work, but I'm also going to make sure that they cover my back so that as right, I'm right. pushing progressive ideas – then the stuff that we've experienced when we talk about the secrets of black leadership and black pain and right. when you out there prophetically leading, you know, you also have to have people who protect your back so that you're not right. getting it from both sides. Right. And I think uh, that coverage, w- whether that's community coverage or political coverage, is really important because when when you're a leader in the black community and you don't have that connection or covering from the community, right. the emperor can be naked and no one tells them. 
Exactly. Um, or they don't care because they don't know the emperor. They haven't spoken with the emperor. So the fact that you've worked and you served in the community so that you could command that level of respect. You can't make people cover you, but you made it easy because of your commitment in the community. That's an important insight. So I would say for folks who are aspiring community activists or leaders, it's important to pull that hold that together because I think sometimes we feel that we could become effective black influencers by just having our hands, just being connected with one segment Mm-hmm. of the community but you've got to really be connected with several of them we can't afford to be dichotomized or divided up because it's not enough of us we've got to be able to pull the faculty and the community-based folks and the grassroots leaders and and the folks who aren't positional leaders but when they speak people listen um, we got to be able to pull all of that together that's that's a responsibility that we have that i think our white counterparts don't have and so you know and so when i it was this group from milwaukee to kind of echo your point there was a group from milwaukee called urban underground and they had come over to mm-hmm. to madison to talk about you know juvenile justice and share their opinions with legislators so they they wanted to come by my office and i remember sitting with those young activists and we they were you know they thought i was just going to kind of come off as being this you know this you know elite right you know, give them a speech about stick to your dreams don't give up don't get in trouble but what i talked about was the need for grassroots activism to change yes. and, and create justice yes. and you know we and you know they i remember the young guys just kind of looking at me you know they even popped out their grills because they wanted to just have <laughs> wait, wait, no. <laughs> Wait, wait, it was that serious? It was that serious. It was, you must I mean, have been breaking I'm, it down. I mean, we were just, the analysis was just going across the room, and they were in my chamber. So they were sitting in my chamber. We were breaking analysis down, pop, <laughs> popping our grills. We were having a conversation. And I, what I got let them understand was you don't have to, you don't have to, well, my position, what I'm trying to, you know, chart a path is say that you don't have to walk away from your mm-hmm. activism of justice and truth and honesty yes, yes. to pursue, you know, careers that we can use to further you know, our our community's goals right, of what we right. want. I said, you know, I'm a judge. We're gonna need mayors and teachers and pastors, professors. We you need you need the chorus of individuals together and it doesn't make you any less legitimate as an activist because you now have a certain type of job exactly. with leadership. I mean you will just take that activism and passion into the boardrooms and when you empower to make courtroom and when you in the position to make policies, then all of that stuff comes back to come back to the That's a very table. good point. Now for our non African American um folks who, who are who are downloading the podcast from all over the world, Japan now, Argentina, Turkey, Morocco, what's the significance of one popping their grill out? So you'd have to go you <laughs> you'd have to go where you can, YouTube is the idea of <laughs> Of grills where they would put them little gold plates on their mouth. I think one one rap song that Nelly uh, wrote was about the. I think that's the best one about grills, and he talks about grills. But the young people now wear them, and when they pop them out, it is almost like they're about to have a serious conversation. <laughs> and so that's I love it. Uh, so when he when when they when they took the grills out, I knew you're like, oh, this is real. We about to have a good conversation. Wow, they, they about to engage. He's about to say something. Yeah, he's about to say, and they start talking. Wow. And so normally they may have been quiet, but to see them engage and uh, really was transformative at that moment. Man, man, that's 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 fantastic. Um, a couple things I want to ask you about, um, <clears throat> just about about growing up. You're from Texas. Yes. What, what part of Texas? Fort Worth, Texas. Fort Worth. Okay. All right. Great. Funky Town. Funky Town. Man. Funky Town. Man, I love I love reading um, your story just about how you work to 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 overcome all kinds of all kinds of things. But there were two women who I uh, just, just reading about you um, who were really strong mentors. One, I think was it Daisy, Miss Daisy, Daisy Wilson. And, and then uh, um, uh, we call her Ma Bell, but Margaret. Uh, Bell. Wow. Wow. And so, you know, these ladies took interest in you because you hadn't, you didn't have any plans for higher education. I mean, you got what, two undergraduate degrees, mm-hmm. three advanced, three, two undergraduate degrees, two masters, a mm-hmm. master's of divinity, a master's of theology, then a JD. Um, from yes. here at the University of Wisconsin. Yes. Am I le- am I leaving any no, degrees no, no, out? No, that's about it. That's enough. That's enough. That's I have enough. enough student loans to justify <laughs> that. <laughs> but man, but you know, you would have been, you know, as what I was reading, and uh, you were bagging um, in a grocery store, not really thinking about your life, and it just makes me think how many brothers and sisters there are out there who are bagging groceries or delivering pieces or doing things that we think might be somewhat menial, but it helps you get by. But the power of mentorship, you know, mentors aren't just people who tell you where you need to go, but they see you. And so um, just tell me a little bit about how these these ladies, these these tremendous mentors, helped you to see who you really were. 
And nothing's yeah. wrong with being a, a, a bagging groceries no, if that's no. where you are. But of course, five degrees later, you're sitting on this bench. You're, you're talking to the whole world on this podcast. Um, we need people to see folks and to open their eyes if they have more potential. So, so what was it about your interaction with them that helped you to see yourself differently? The uh, you know, one of the things that I've been really talking about more, uh, Alex, is you know, uh, being a victim of sexual abuse and, you know, enduring 12 years of my sister being abused. Her name was Chantal Mitchell. Right. And Sean, and at the hands of my stepfather, endured a lot of uh, 12 years where we were trying to get help and we didn't get help. And then Man. I had my own victimization that I had suppressed for years of being pain. So, uh, you know, when you have all of that trauma inside your body, the last thing you think about is school and education. Right. Right. So we always we were always just trying to survive, and um, it wasn't until um, the, my senior year, my last semester of high school, that we actually got some help. So I struggled. Not until yeah. senior year of high school. Senior year of high school. So that was twelve years. I mean, it was little twelve years of just hell right, trying to right. get help. And it wasn't until uh, that last semester that um, that I actually got some help. So okay. I was a good, you know, obviously, you know, one beautiful thing about black church, I could speak and I could talk. You started preaching at 15. I started preaching, I started at, preaching 15. at 15. Exactly. So, you know, those skills in right, the church right. encourage you to speak. So I was a good speaker. I was good in math, but I couldn't, I could barely read. And so nobody knew that. Okay. Uh, but me, I knew I couldn't. I knew Your I school struggled. teachers knew it, but they still passed you. Well, you know, because they could, you know, they always, I was a good kid. So I wasn't, you know, sure. I was always just there and they would always help me with assignments. Gotcha, gotcha. And it wasn't until I got to Jarvis that it got really exposed that I. And that's a local community college. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. down in Hawkins, Texas. That, uh, and I, and I appreciate Jarvis for that. And so. Sure, sure. When I failed everything, when I first went to school, I ran into, it was Ma Bell and Miss Wilson. Miss Wilson uh, pulled me into her office. And she said, uh, Everett, uh, baby, you're a diamond in the rough, and we're going to help you. Mm. And uh, so she said, uh, I'm going to teach you, and, and I'm going to show you how to study. I'm going to show you how to read. No, was she an advisor or an instructor? She, at was, the a, school? she, was, a she, was, she was an English teacher. She was an English teacher, okay. And I wasn't taking a class from her. That's what made it so, so beautiful. She, so you weren't one of her students? I wasn't even one of her students. Man. And so she just literally grabbed me out the hallway and said, you know, uh, don't 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 worry about you know when you we're gonna edit your papers and I'm gonna show you how to do this. Uh, she told wow. me to go to the library every day from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. every day and study uh, and just struggle through it. And that's what I did every you know I I could never turn in the paper on time. It was always right, had to be right. two weeks early, and we would work for those two weeks to make sure it was a fine product. And uh, so mentorship for me with Miss Wilson and Marbell and Marbell I called her on Mother's Day. And she's in I was her, gonna ask if any of them are 80s. still living. Miss uh, Wilson just passed, but my bell is in her eighties, and uh, I call her every now and then just to check in sure. on and tell her thank you and how much I appreciate her. You said you called her on Mother's Day. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I call wow. her all the time, and just she just she just missed so much, man, because I wouldn't be here today if they hadn't That's saw amazing. me. And so I know she's proud, but I know she can't. She's not surprised. Yeah, she 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 yeah she always she always says you know it was always there. Always, always there. there. So, Miss Wilson, what I what I always take from Miss Wilson was, you know, mentorship. A lot of times, people think mentorship is about just telling people where they go. Right. But Miss Wilson was the mentor who took me through the door herself. She actually took my hand wow. and walked me through the door. And so, for me, even now, I hold Miss Wilson and Miss and my Bell with everything I do for everybody I talk Understandably. to. Understandably, right? Because I would. I mean, I promise you, man. To that that mentorship that they gave me allowed me to go to switch to Morehouse. And then when I went to Morehouse, that foundation that they gave me sure. gave me the foundation to go on to Princeton and right. you know and to continue to work uh, moving forward. And that's amazing. Now you and I have both had black and white mentors. Were these two women African American? I'm yes. just curious. Yes. And with Jarvis, is it what was the racial makeup? Was it was it largely African American? No, it, it was. I would say it was uh, uh, 98 percent African American. Wow. So I just, I mean, I keep thinking about this scenario. You're, you're walking in the hall. Uh, Miss Wilson doesn't know. I mean, you're not her student. Somehow she must have heard something about your grades or your performance. I think my bell, I was taking math for my bell. She was my math professor. But, but she and Miss Wilson were probably friends or talked. Yes. yes. But just that community feel that you was walking to someone and just say, baby. I like, I, I read that, that the quote said baby. Cause that's, I mean, what professors walk up to students and call them baby? You know, hey baby, you're a diamond. 
your diamond in the rough. Just having that role model, having a mm-hmm. person who maybe who's lived it, maybe you reminded her of a child, a nephew, a grandchild, a brother, someone, but having the boldness to speak that out because she saw it, but not everyone speaks out what they see. But for her to reach out to you and to give you some some directions, like go to the library from five to 10, and for you to do it, I mean, not that any of this was easy, but the but the beginning of change, the beginning of transformation begins with that relationship and someone mm-hmm. just breaking into your world saying, I see something in you yep. you don't see. Unite Invisible. Yes. Yes. You know, and I and I had and since I had just failed everything, to me that was confirmation that I didn't belong. Right, right. You know, it was confirmation I I just need to go home and finish, you know, go back to the job and go back. But that that her grabbing me out the hallway being seen was a pivotal moment. Uh, for me and you know and I went from basically failing at midterms to making four point o's the duration of my time there at school wow <clears throat> did you transfer out before finishing up at Jarvis mm-hmm. yeah I transferred to Morehouse man but to have failed everything that you know beginning of that semester then transfer to to a prestigious school like Morehouse man is incredible when I was reading about your background I thought you met those sisters maybe through your church or maybe through your high school I didn't realize that they were part of the community college, man, that's that's amazing. So just a shout out to all the teachers, mentors, um, advisors who see students, who call them out. That is so, so important. You know, um, earlier, Judge, you were talking about um, the pain and, and you know, you, you and your sister were struggling to get help and support. And it finally came as you when you were a senior. And, and one of your quotes um, uh, it was an article or something that was written, I think, in 17, where you said, um, we're not really dealing with uh, a school to prison pipeline here in Wisconsin, but it really is a child welfare to delinquency to adult prison. That's the issue. You yeah. said children are, are abused, they're broken, they're hurt, and we're not giving them the services um, that they need. Um, again, this is a quote from last year, but but do you still feel that that's true, that the pipeline really has to do with child welfare and kids having this pain and we're not addressing it and we're expecting them to perform at school and they're living in a in a, in a, um, in a war field or, or um, in a battlefield? I think people... I think people take my comments when I talk about the child welfare, the juvenile delinquency to adult prison pipeline. The systems partners, they get so defensive. Sure. But I'm telling them, I'm saying, look at what you're seeing with our black and brown children. Like every case file that I have seen. Now, I'm not saying I have all the solutions. Right. But I'm looking at every case file that I have for a juvenile that has escalated to the point where we're talking about adult prison. Okay. You go back and all of them have been in the system since they were four or five years old. We talking about they have experienced abuse and trauma yeah. and neglect, homelessness, homelessness all, that stuff. all of that, all of that stuff. I mean, I got one kid, man. He's he's now uh, an adult. Got waved up to adult. Uh, I think in another jurisdiction, but he had been moved out of his home twenty nine times. By the time 29. he twenty nine, twenty nine times between the age of five and fifteen. 29 times. And how do we not think that that's an indication of where they're going to be? Now, if one move is traumatic. Right. And they say that increases the childhood adverse childhood right, experiences, right. right? Think about 29. And, and of those 29, you put them back in the same places where they've been abused their life, and then they get taken again and right. again and again and again and again and again. And then we're shocked when they perpetrate some of those same crimes or, or against other people. Not that all do, but when it does happen, yeah. it's like we're not connecting that, that, these we don't dots. Connect, or the fact that then... They uh, build relationships in these community groups that are antisocial and create do crimes because that's the only place that they've ever found some consistency uh, of, mm. of emotion and relationships. So uh, when you know when I what I'm really trying to do is use the platform again as a judge and combining it with my speaking ability to really say, like I've said, like too often these young black and brown children have been acted on and the com- our community has no idea. Right, right. And it, it just broke my heart, Alex, when all of the work we've been doing all these years, you know, since I've been in Madison, right, we've been right. pushing the needle. And then I step behind this door and I'm looking at all our children. I'm like, right, whoa, right. whoa, whoa, whoa. This is not, this is not what any of us have put our hearts in line. Right. In line. We, we right. don't support none of this. So we have to step back and ask the question, you know, what is it that we are trying to do exactly. with these families so that we are making sure these children are in a safe place? Right, right. I, I've, I've talked to um, young men because, you know, our, our nonprofit, Nehemiah Works, um, we're involved in reentry work. When I talk to some of these young men, 
who tell me about what's happened to them in foster care. <clears throat> so maybe, you know, their mother wasn't the, the most fit parent or was struggling, had a drinking problem. You put them in a white foster home. You put them outside in the rural areas, the names they're called, the things that's happening to them, the things that are done to them. That stuff doesn't come to the light. It looks like the kid is the problem. Okay, they move from their mom's house and we don't know why. They're in this foster home. Then they're in another foster home. Then they're, they're in another foster home. Then they're, they're in Lincoln Hills or they, they go to prison. But I, I like what you're saying about pulling the covers back and finding out what's the real nexus of this. Where is this starting? Yep. And we got to get at that. Tra- we got to one prevent that trauma. But we yep. got to start dealing with children much younger I agree. than trying to pull people out the river when they've been in prison 13, 14 years because they're still not dealing with the childhood trauma. No, no, and that's and that's the thing that you know. Even when you go to adult side and you start working, and you just work your way back, everybody who's been in adult prison will tell you about the trauma that they experienced. Right. You know, right. at a young age, definitely. And, and they just continue to go throughout that system. And as a as a judge, me having those experiences of going through all that trauma allows for me to at least say that these kids are not damaged goods. And so when people wow. will say, well, well, judge, you know, you don't understand, you know, public safety or we need to put this kid sure. away. And I'm telling them, I'm saying, listen. So we're blaming the victims. I say, yeah, exactly. So I say, listen, to, do you think do you think me as the judge? Right. Who has the power now to sentence right, right. whatever that that as a judge that I am broken beyond repair. I That's said then, powerful. then these children are not broken beyond repair. I said, but there are certain things that they need in order to make right. sure that they have the capacity to come back when they're ready to come back. So that's what led me to really looking at. Um, you know, taking handcuffs off the kids. And then secondly, right. You pushed that to have handcuffs taken yeah. off kids in your court. Yeah, no, man, it, it just, if that's you, dehumanizing, that's dehumanizing, especially when we know that these kids have been through like, right, right, right. You know, and when, you know, my one young girl and, uh, she has been, she, you know, it's amazing when you, uh, when you, when you look at life through their eyes, you know, she was the one young girl that I could not understand why we would have her in handcuffs, considering all the stuff that this young baby right, had been right, through. Right, right. But then also education. Then, you know, I don't want to be a part of a system that makes it worse. So mm-hmm. that's why I say we need to take the handcuffs off. They need to see us as a part of a positive right, process, right. not a negative one. Hi, this is Jeremy Holiday, and I'm one of the editors of the Black Like Me show. And I just want to take a minute now to talk to you a little bit about Patreon. The show that we put together here is the culmination of an effort of a lot of people. And in order to do it, we need your support. We've been working for a while to come up with a Patreon that works well for people. And the levels that existed before, we recently added the $2 level, which is there for you if you like the show and you just want to give a little bit of support. It's cheaper than a cup of coffee. I mean, I don't think you can find a cup of coffee anywhere or half a cup of coffee for $2. And we have a $6 level where you'll get a shout out on the show, a $10 level where you can submit questions to Dr. G and he'll respond to them. And then the $25 level, which is whenever we have a live event, you get a VIP invite. And whenever we start producing merch, you get that merch as well so if you like what you hear on the show and you want to support it go to patreon.com slash black like me and check out the levels to see if one fits for you now back to dr g and then we start i start paying alex i start paying attention to school mm-hmm. and so you know education you know is very important for kids who've been traumatized so right, they can have right. the skills to come back right. alex i i can't tell you how many um and I know this is happening everywhere. If it's happening, they can't. I know it's happening all over the place. Mm-hmm. Where kids who are in court ordered or who have special education IEPs, where they're being placed in shortened school days, right? And the shortened school people say, well, you know, kids behavior issues. They, you know, they need to learn how to act right before they're in school. I said, not if they're special education. If they're special education, there isn't supposed to be a, you know, a behavioral uh, issue where you, they don't provide them services. They're not supposed to do that. But we routinely, our children are placed in that. Uh, yes, yes. So, so that's not raising the bar. You know, if if I break my leg, someone's going to try to help me to walk again or run again or help integrate me back into society. Yeah. How do you take kids who are already struggling, who already have strikes against them, and then lower the bar? That feels like we're grooming them, grooming them for something. I tell I tell the kids like all, a prison system. Of course, I tell system. the kids all the time. I said, you know, this is my example to them. I said, you go into a restaurant. And you go to a restaurant and they pull out the menu and they got one item on the menu. And they say on that one item is we got some maggots. We got some uh, old three day old meat that we put on the grill for you. We put some salt and pepper on it, but that's what you're going to get. The bread is molded. Yeah. And that's the only option you have. How many of y'all want that option? 
The kids would be like, man, I don't want that mess. That's nasty. I said, y'all want to go to a restaurant where you got an appetizer choice, where you have right. an entree choice, we got dessert choice, where they give you different drinks right. that you want. You won't be able to choose all of that, right? I said, when y'all, when you do not have an education, you only have one option. And you will take that one option right. whether you like it or not. Right. And I said, for many of you, uh, because of how this has been structured around you, you don't even see education as important. You think it's just optional when everybody around her knows that if you don't have your education, that's only one place for you right. to go. Right. And we all know that one place. Right. And it's called bars. It's called sales. It's called concrete. And we all know what that is. Right. Or it's called cemetery. Or cemetery. So, And both of them are concrete. Right, right, so you right. Have, so, you have, so that's why as a judge, I'm trying to slow down the process wow. To ask these questions about how are the system actors uh, participating in you know either freeing these this soul that's before me, or trying to really lead them down into a path of further incarceration. Man, you know that what you're just saying now, judges make is bringing light to a uh, to a quote. Um, man, it's crazy when people take quotes off you know off the internet because you might think, well, I didn't really say it like that. But but the gist of it is, you said when a young person stands before me this is likely the most important and pivotal moment in that young person's life. It's a moment that can change their path in the society's future. And so for people who might be thinking what we're talking about here, what you're talking about is going easy on these folks. You're talking about humanizing them because if we don't treat them right, um, their negative influence will impact society. So when we're deciding the fate or encouraging the fate of a young person, we're really encouraging the fate of us all. And I really like the way that quote um, uh, depicts the fact that you're, that you're bringing it together. Let's stop isolating these children as if they're not a product of our society and won't influence our society. Yeah, even even when I have to incarcerate a child, you still need to be able to tell the child why you're incarcerating them. Right. You need to be able to explain to them what you want them to work on. You need to be able to articulate to them right. what are some of the concerns. You can't, you know, you, you can't, you know, use this as a moment to point your finger at them and tell them That's how important. bad they, they they don't need that. I mean, their lives are already hell. Right. The they're, fact that they in your courtroom means that life is hell. Right. Now, no right. child. No, there are very few children who come from a place of privilege who end up in the courtroom. The rest, the rest of these children are already wow. living in hell. So they they don't need you to point fingers. They don't at need them. you throwing gasoline on no, a fire. No. They're already hot. They need you to put ice. Wow. And, and or as we say That's in the good. black as we say in the black church, they need to, they need you to put the bomb in Gilead. Right, right. You know, that heals That'll their preach. soul. That the heals their soul. Yes, right. That's what they need. That's and what they really need. And that's what I give them. I, I I don't I tell them all the time, you know, I tell kids, I say, I'm not your judge, I'm your reflection. Look at me. I made it, you can make it. This is what I will work. if you trust me and you trust me that I've always done right by you, I've always treated you right, have I not? And most kids are like, yes, you have your honor. And I said, I'm going to continue to do right by you. So this is what we will do together. And, you know, whatever I, I, prom- That's whatever I promise them, whatever I promise them, I, I keep my word to them. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. don't just throw them away. And they and they don't they, they don't come, they don't walk out the courtroom thinking I, I was just treated unjust. Right. right, right. And they don't feel like they had a mere slap on the wrist. They knew that they... Mm-hmm. They met a, a level of justice that that was coded with love, and that it was that it was fair, the way justice should be. Where justice should be. You know, one of the things I, I I really respect about you a number of things, but the fact that you went to visit one of our troubled um, facilities for for youth, um, Lincoln Hills, and we don't have to go into great details about that, but the fact that you said, if I'm going to be um, sentencing children to this place, let me at least go see what it looks like, because. There are so many folks who, so many judges that have not gone into a prison. They don't really know where they're sending people. Um, I don't know that they believe that 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 um, solitary confinement is even happening. But the, you know, just I won't I, I won't even traumatize our listeners, um, you know, by just some of the sounds and things you heard. But the fact that you went to see it, that this is real, that was really important. That was when I read that, um, I appreciated it. And it wasn't just, and it was good for me to go, but I took my staff too. Yes, I like and that too. I, I took some of the DA exactly. office. I took some. You of the didn't need to go by yourself. Good, I, you know, good. It, you know, because me going by Use myself. that power, right? Me. I'm like, no, all y'all, come on. You gonna see it with me? Yeah, we took a whole van full because I wanted, I wanted all of them to be have an appreciation for, and I, you know, I had been to prison, so I already knew, but I realized that the other actors who were also doing this right. had never seen it, right? And they needed to see. They needed to see and witness this for themselves. Right. Now, you said you've been to a prison. You didn't say you've been to prison. Right? No, I ain't never been to okay, prison. Okay, that's right. I just want to, to make sure people yeah, out there. Yeah. No, I've never. <clears throat> I, I, you, can't, you can't make it this far and have a criminal record. <laughs> I know. I, know you, I want to make sure. Yeah. You know, um, one of the last things I want to talk to you about is consolidated court 
automation programs. We call it CCAP in the community. And you've been part of um, um, the Wisconsin Court Access um, um, system. It was, I think it was an advisory committee committee. put together for, committee for like 16 and 17. Um, the best way to describe CCAP is, is uh, sort of a Google for anyone who's had a case or a charge. Um, basically, can anyone go to CCAP to, to put someone's name in to find out what their what their background is? I yeah, mean, it's, as, as, it's free to anybody. And CCAP is not just germane to Wisconsin. It's it's used across the the country. Am I is that now, actually Wisconsin? I think is one of the only places that has a court automated system that allows for any user to just Wisconsin access is it. unique in that way because it allows for any user to any user. access it. Regard don't have to pay for no. There's no fees attached right. to it because it mm-hmm. used to be a fee for some of the like for background checks. Yes. So now. So we know a number of things can happen. Employers could do C, could check CCAP if someone's name sounds too ethnic or too many apostrophes or dashes in it or sounds too black or, or too Latino or whatever. But I just found out that um, that a ruling or, or, or happened early this year, and you're part of this team that uh, that dismisses criminal um, and eviction and other cases. They'll no longer be displayed on that website after two years. Man, I got to give you a fist bump for that. Now, I can always ask questions like, why two years? But... Man, just the fact that if if the case was dismissed or if it was dropped, a uh, person found not guilty yeah. after two years, Be it's gone. it's gone right off of CCAP. So I can't Google no. that after two years or no. CCAP. We, you know, we use it like a verb. Yeah. C, we're CCAPing it. Man, that that is now, how, now see, how this, significant is that? Now let, and, and just give you the backstory of that, so you, yes. so your listeners understand why all of your life experience is so important. So I go, I'm a new judge. I get appointed to this committee, right? Okay. Now, you know, I worked in Madison Area Urban Ministry. We've been dealing with incarceration, of course, and evictions, of course. and housing issues, jobs. Right, right. So I sit on that committee, and, and as a former prosecutor, I'm sitting there, and they were, you know, the length of CCAP, so your listeners know, it used to be up to 60 to 70 years. I read that. Even if, even if a person was found not guilty, it still was going still still to sit on so CCAP. So my employers, landlord, Landlords, anybody can see, can see it. it. So I sat down on committee, and that was the first thing they asked the question on. And so, you know, automatically, I said anything that is dismissed on a prosecutor's motion or a person goes to trial and dismissed ought to be automatically removed from CCAP. You just set that right out, <laughs> right, right out, out the gate, right out the gate. And you, the pushback was amazing to me. I'm like, these people are innocent. And so they did. So they did a. Um, that's, so that's then, mind you know, I know. So we had a couple sessions. Okay. And, you know, I'm still saying the same thing, right? So I'm still hitting the same thing. And then so they said, well, let's go pull the data just so we can see how okay. many people whose cases, uh, and we ain't talking about plea deals, but just straight out dismissed. Just dismissed. And, gotcha. you know, okay. not guilty. They pulled the data, Alex. We're talking about just for criminal crimes alone, right. over 200,000 Wisconsin. 200,000 people in Wisconsin. In Wisconsin had stuff on CCAP that had been dismissed or they were found not guilty. And it's still up there. And it was still up there. 200. Yeah. Now, and that's even more, it was even more so when we talked about evictions, right? So, oh, my goodness. So that, this is ruining people's lives. Ruining people's lives. And so the, and so what I what I expressed to them was, as a former prosecutor, and I said the prosecutors in the room know this yeah. is true. Like, right. you would charge stuff, and then you get more facts, and find that none of that stuff was true. Like, right. I'm like, oh, man, this is crap. And so right. you dismiss it. Right. It's still there. It's still there. It was still there. So oh, that's my when goodness. And so we were coming up to the final vote and Representative uh Robin Voss, to his credit, came in because he had a black staffer who mm. couldn't get a job because he had been falsely accused of having um a of like armed robbery or sure, something like sure. that. So he, he was a good young man and a positive young man, but he had Karen concealed and somebody thought he was a robber, so they arrested right. him, charged him, found out that no, that wasn't true. But guess what guess what that charge was still on? CCAP. CCAP. <clears throat> and so it wasn't until Representative Voss knew someone and Again, we, to his, to you know, to his, to, to his credit, he came to that. And when we, when but when we, you don't know anyone, you just think, well, you must have done something. I mean, if it's out there on CCAP, you must, you can't be all that clear. You must that, have done something. And that's what they, that's what people kept saying. Well, if it's on CCAP, then it must be true. So I mean, because of this crazy rule of things that used to be on CCAP for fifty, sixty years, it now becomes sort of a self fulfilling prophecy. If it's there, it must be real. Mm-hmm. Rather than saying this isn't real, the, the the case was dropped, it was dismissed, they were not guilty. Let's not put it up. The pushback in that committee proves why CCAP is so dangerous. That exactly. the assumption is these folks know CCAP, mm-hmm. and they're still saying, "Well, they must have done something." So imagine the employers out there yeah. that are looking at it, just thinking, mm, 
And you know, people are sea capping folks that are dating their daughters, the sons, people coming to work for them. That is huge. And so, um, yeah, I know it has great implications for Wisconsin. Does it? Does it? Does it have any national? Does that set a national precedent of well, some sort? I think maybe this conversation will help people to, you know, really make sure that they're protecting people's information. Definitely, definitely. Uh, whether whether we're talking about you know, CCAP is criminal as well as evictions, as well as divorces. I didn't but, know that it was divorces and evictions. I just thought it was criminal stuff. It's evictions. It's evictions. And it's civil case that's filed against you is listed there too. Really? So any any credit cards or any evictions, any defaults, any child support, so all of those civil cases, family cases, divorces, paternity, freely ac- no. you can freely access all of those inf- those things. So that's why to me it was very important, very important to argue that anything that could implicate or, you know, so for example, people from, you know, Minnesota could look up CCAP and then see something and then deny people jobs rather than them paying for a full background to check to see what really happens. Right. We need to get all that removed. And the window to go from 70 years down to two for sure, felonies I and got then to, down to six that's months. Huge, that's that, huge, man. Uh, you know, to me, that gives people some relief. Sure. That no one, you know, they was dismissed and then, you know, moving forward, they won't have to deal with that. Well, man, you that was a long list of committee members. Um, folks were part of the WCCA Oversight Committee. But I want you to know I, I appreciate that because that's that's huge. You know what I've noticed is when I used to hear CCAP, I would think about the, the, the men and women who have been formerly incarcerated, like the ones we've worked with. But I've also, in the last few years, I've met white colleagues, church members yes. who are accused of um, certain things that would affect their job as a, um, a counselor or, or, or police officer. Um, when those things are dropped and it's still on CCAP, I wonder if that just pushed the conversation to a different level. I mean... I knew the black and brown people were struggling with this. But in the last few years, I've heard an outcry from more white people about either their black colleagues who were who were stumped by CCAP or people in their own families having these, you know, these these issues. So whatever, you know, whatever the case, whether people did it because it wasn't fair to, to black people or because more white people were being stuck in it. And so folks said, oh, my gosh, we got to do something. I'm just glad that you all. Yeah. Did something, and that's. I mean, does that need to be voted on? Is that is that all passed? It, it, we voted on it's it. It's got teeth. It, we voted on it, and it got thumbs up. So we sent it to the director of state courts, and that he accepted that formal recommendation. So that is the policy moving forward. That is so, that is fantastic, man. So I just have to tell you again, I appreciate that work on it. I was in a meeting, and someone mentioned it. And I said, "Wait, no, that's no, that's not that's not true." And then it's because you know, you know, judge, I teach with your, you know, with your wife. You all, you all are just a dynamic you know, couple. I mean, you got these degrees and she's got a PhD, JD. So we, we co-teach a class at a local college and she said, no, no, Everett actually worked on the committee. So, cause a student brought it up at first. I thought, no, no, I would have heard about that. She said, no, Everett was on a committee. And then I was in a meeting a couple of weeks ago with Linda mm-hmm. and it came up again. So that's when I said, I want to get judge Mitchell on the air. Cause one, I got to verify this yeah. and two, I got to thank him and the committee for that kind of work. Cause that's going to help people. Um, have a fair shake because we can do all the reentry work, um, help people process their pain. But if the system is still against them so that they can't get meaningful employment or housing, we're pushing them back to the streets and saying, why don't you just do what you did did before? So, man, I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, you so I mean, and that's what I think these, one, these conversations about what does it mean to be, you know, to be black and you know to low income or to be disadvantaged, you don't want to have systems that further alienate, exactly. further oppress people, especially when the intent is to make sure that they have a exactly. bridge out of exactly. where they're going to that next level. Right. Let's help them that. or admit that we're hurting them. Yeah. Hey, just a couple of closing questions. I right. really appreciate um, appreciate your time. Um, what legacy is is there a legacy um, that you want to leave your family? The second part of that is society. I think. You know, since I didn't have a father growing up, Mm -hmm. it was very important to me that my children know who I am. And so um, so I do a lot of stuff for my kids because I want them to know me, you know, because I don't know for how long I'm going to live. You Mm -hmm. know, I've been pushing and grinding in my body for a long time. Yeah, I've heard you say that. You know, so I got a box of all the stuff that I've done. And so they have all my accomplishments so they can always find me if I'm never around Mm -hmm. to finish Mm -hmm. their life. 
Um, and so for me, it's very important to to do a lot of things with my children. So I'm always at my kid's school. I, you know, my That's son great. knows his dad is a judge. In fact, he told his class, <laughs> I have two robes. He, he said, I have a black robe at work and a white robe at home. <laughs> I, said, son, <laughs> oh, I said, son, don't be telling me what I, what I wear at home. That's right. That's right. Uh, <laughs> but I'm there. And uh, and so I read. I, I even volunteered to teach, coach, coach, coach my uh, daughter's seventh eighth grade basketball team oh man that's you know, great so i leave work and got there put on my shoes run around with the girls my daughter uh so i want them to know what it's like to be safe sure, and i want sure. them to feel protected i want them to feel honored and loved and and know that i love them and, and i know they do with know them. and then for, just for society i just I, I want all the broken kids to know that you still can bring your life back together again mm-hmm. you know my favorite uh scripture mm-hmm. in the bible is the potter's house in Jeremiah. I mean, yes. the fact that God saw something in it and broke yes. it and remade it all over again. To me, that that is what I, I that is what I believe. You know, combining the spirituality with my, you know, prophetic and giving my life is all about the the leaving a path so that others can follow is is essential to me. And so sometimes maybe I do speak out a lot and I speak on issues. Because I think we need you to. We have to. Like we have we need to. You to. We have to. And 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 you know maybe in some other time somebody will appreciate the work. But I think about the fact that they didn't like Martin Luther King. Right. And now they honor him. So right. we got to right. keep speaking out, regardless sure. if it's popular right sure. now or not. And th- the beauty of that tension that you hold. I mean, part of the, part of the court system, corrections, is about protecting society. But as a as a man of faith, you believe in redemption. As a man who's lived through painful experiences that have been redeemed you believe in redemption so for you to understand that you have a duty a sworn duty to protect society but part of protecting society is not letting people who have already been victimized become over victimized and so in some ways i don't see that as a dichotomy i don't see those as as being juxtaposed that part of protecting society is not further traumatizing a person who's been traumatized get him or her the support the care and the love they need because that's part of protecting society too and you embody that Man. So well, just, what you just so said, well. what you just said, Alice, is is the key. I don't know why we think that protecting of society is just locking folks right, up, right? Right, because they will come back. They come. Most and, of the people in prison are coming exactly, out, and when they come back, the question is, what have you done, right, to give them the roadmap? Are they coming back more dangerous, or are they coming back in a better right. place because you gave them the map exactly. that they needed to do that? Because you and I both know they're receiving a world class education in criminology behind those bars. They're telling me. Exactly. They're coming out learning things, exactly. seeing things they've never thought about. Yep. So how we treat them when they're away and how we receive them when they come back. And you know, for those of you, you, Jerome and others who've been in the reentry game longer than I have, have taught me even to say to men and women who are just being released back to the community, welcome home. Just saying we're glad that you're back just something as small as that now mm-hmm. we you know we're providing housing and other kinds of support for it yep. but my first response is not oh what did you do or where were you or how long did you how long were you away it's it's welcome home because mm-hmm. they've got to have that sense that they're part of us yeah um do you have an audacious long-term goal no I'll be honest with you, man. Supreme Court justice, U.S. Yeah. Supreme Court justice, federal judge, and I, I it mean, might be. And I don't want to get you in trouble talking too far down the road. I'm just wondering if there's just a. No, I, I'll, be on, I'll be honest goal. with you, man. I, I'm very simple, man. I I like what I do now, and you know, quite honestly, I just I love being a father, and mm-hmm. I love being a mm-hmm. husband. I love being a pastor. I love being I love being able to use this position to help reshape a narrative that I think has been it's too powerful. long yes. in the making. And, you know, what I do next or whatever is next, you know, I'm not even giving no thought. Hell, two years ago, I, would, I didn't even think about being a judge. So, wow. So, wow, that's true. So I just 20 I, years ago, yeah, you're bagging groceries. Yeah, exactly. So I, I'm Paper just, plastic. I'm just plastic. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and I'm just open to wherever, you know, life leads me. But right now, I am I am that's y- uniquely satisfied that all of my it's life powerful. makes sense in this position where I'm at right now. All my life makes sense. I love that. Last question. Last question, Judge. If you could have dinner with two individuals and um, ask them anything you want, but one of the individuals is not is deceased and one's, one's living, who would those individuals be? If you could just have a conversation with them over dinner, one, one deceased person, one, one living person. I would... I would have a conversation with this this young woman. I can't believe I'm spacing on her name now, but she gave her life uh, uh, in the Palestinian struggle with Israel. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. And she was a young white lady, and she went down. To I heard Israel. of her. You've heard of her? Mm-hmm. And she she committed her life uh, and stood between the tank and the, and the Palestinian home, and she was she was killed. I I want to have dinner with her and just to talk about what is it that made her give her life for that. And she would be uh, a person that I would start uh, a meaningful conversation with because just to sacrifice for uh, that struggle and to bring international attention through her own sacrifice is important. Is it uh, Rachel Corey? Rachel Corey. Okay. Rachel Corey, yes. I would have that conversation with Rachel. And I know her parents were recently here, but she would be one. And then, you know, someone uh, living... um, I'd want to meet the. I'd want to sit with the uh, the young women who started the Black Lives Matter movement. Okay. And oh, would, that would be great. And I would love to hear their visions mm-hmm. of what they see our community moving forward because I think they have turned the page on a conversation that started deeply within the civil rights. Yes. Yes. And they've opened up a new chapter to allow all of us a way to, I won't say recycle but to maybe reboot a different way to see engagement in the world again. So that's powerful. I just think, I just think the book end of my mind is these women are reshaped, have reshaped and are reshaping history. Sure. sure. And I just would cont- love to be able to continue to set my male privilege aside and listen. And listen to I, man, I love those answers. Could I sit in on your court sometime or outsiders yeah. are able to still sit in and, and, and do that? Yeah, I think uh, I've been, what's called ride along. Yes. And we bring in and I've brought in, you know, some of our community leaders here, to really come and I'd be see. interested in doing that. Yeah, you, I, I mean, I think once you see what I'm, once you see it and you mm-hmm. read the files, you'll get a sense of why sure. I'm saying put the brakes on and then trying to see, step back and ask the conversation, what can we be doing as a community, you know, not just in Dane County, but throughout the state. And I, and I bet you what you're seeing in the state of Wisconsin is happening throughout our entire nation. Oh, I bet. I bet. I I'm bet almost it certain it's happening Definitely. throughout our entire nation Definitely. because we need to figure out a different way. Definitely. Well, Judge Mitchell, I really appreciate your time. I know you got to write some um, some things up today for, for your work, some briefs or, or whatever those legal things are called. You got to do that. But to take time to sit here with me and, and talk so that um, folks around the country and the world could really um, hear about what it is you do and just to, to, to listen into um, black excellence um, on 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 display is just phenomenal. Uh, so I want you to know I appreciate your time. Ce- I celebrate you, the things that you've overcome, the goals that you have, the peace that you have, the example that you're setting. Man, it's just it's it's, it's phenomenal. And I just I really really appreciate it. And down the road, um, I'd love to have you just come back on again and just talk about new new endeavors or new things that's happening in court systems or when there's other um, real news. Um, um, worthy changes or decisions that are being made. I love just to get your perspective on that from, from time to time. Yeah, I think the, uh, the next juvenile, the fact that, the, you know, the changing Lincoln Hills, breaking it up, it'd be interesting to see what conversations we have in our community about what our local uh, juvenile mm-hmm. justice will look like now. Definitely. Definitely. And if you ever get any thoughts about who should come in with us and talk about these kinds of things, Hit me up, text me, because I'd love, I'd love to have them in the studio so we can talk about those things. Sounds good. Oh, man. So listen, thank you all again for, for tuning in to Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G. And I want to just say to the new folks who are listening in South America, our new friends in Japan. Um, Konnichiwa. And, yeah. All right now. All right now. And listen, our listeners in Sweden and the UK and Ireland, they're blowing up. They, those numbers just keep increasing. Hey, keep sharing the love. Keep letting people know this. Um, you can you can um, subscribe to Black Like Me on iTunes and also on Spotify. And for the Android users, if you just go to your Google search function, you've got to put in Black Like Me podcast. Otherwise, you get a whole lot of other black stuff. Um, but Black Like Me podcast, and you can either listen or subscribe right there. Um, if you want more information about some of my blogs and other things that I'm working on, you can go to alexg.com. Ooh, black like me, yeah. I want to thank Corey Saffold for creating the music for this podcast. My podcast manager, Tyler Nyland, engineer and editor, Eli Steenlich, my editor, Jeremy Holiday, and a special thank you to WORT Studios, where we record Black Like Me. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. You can find out more about Dr. Alex G's amazing work at www.alexg.com. Black Like Me is sponsored by the generosity of the Human Family Unity Foundation. Ooh, black like me.